Well, good morning. good morning. For those of you gathered here and those of you gathered online, it is good to be back among you in my official capacity this morning, uh, but I was also glad to welcome so many of you to my home yesterday, and I want to thank everyone who made the trip out. Whether you made it there or not, thank you for making the effort um, and giving me a chance to practice hospitality with you yesterday. And um, I know there have been some busy people this week also offering hospitality to strangers. And so Lois, would you like to give us an update on that? Good morning. I'm representing the team um, that has helped to settle uh, a new family to our area. So let me kind of give you a little background. There is also some in the bulletin. This past week, we as a congregation were able to extend a welcome to a young family recently arrived from Afghanistan. Mother, father, and three young sons arrived Tuesday after a long journey across countries and continents. The family left home 10 months ago, passing through Abu Dhabi before landing in the United States to be processed at a center for refugees in Virginia. Most of us, when we travel, know that it's circular. We're leaving and then we're gonna go back, right? Um, that is unlikely for this family, at least now. 18 days after arriving in Virginia, they began what we all hope will be the last leg of their journey on the road to freedom, safety, and opportunity. Resettlement in Lancaster means for them reconnecting with family who are already here and making new friends. So friends in this congregation, volunteer opportunities will come up from time to time. We will continue to be called upon to open our arms and embrace these new residents of our community. Thanks for all you have done so far. Hi, and to piggyback on that, um, I do have some photos of the apartment and our family. They, um, I will have them in the narthex after church if you'd like to take a peek. We just ask that you don't um, send the image out onto the internet um, or reveal any of their identities just for safety purposes, but please come look at our family and the apartment that you all helped to create. We really appreciate everyone's love. Are there any other announcements this morning? I'd just like to give a little reminder about our hot dog canvas that we have right now. Uh, this Sunday and next will be your last two opportunities to provide hot dogs for the Columbia Area Food Bank. Uh, this is a summer project that we have undertaken many years. It started with our youth group lots of years ago. And it's very welcome to the community because, of course, the kids do not get their lunches in school. And if you would prefer to give money, uh, you can do that, making a check out to our church, put it in an envelope, and mark it for Hot Dog Project, uh, Columbia Food Bank. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any others. It is said, serve first, last, and always even when you get nothing back in return. Love without limit, be it enemy, friend, or stranger. For it is in serving and loving that we carry our crosses and become true disciples of Christ's love. Welcome to worship.
Good morning. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in a responsive call to worship found in your bulletin. You will read the bolded text and please remain in this posture of praise for the hymn and invocation. In mutual compassion and authentic love, we gather as the family of God. We offer our gifts, our hope, and our lives to build up this community of faith. We bring our songs of gratitude and joy. Bless God with our worship and praise. Please join in singing hymn 420. Let us pray. Loving God, we come in search of you and your loving wisdom. Come to us and gather us in your love. Mold us into a community of compassion that is strengthened by the unity and power of your Holy Spirit. In joyous gratitude, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn in your hymnal to page 850. We'll be reading our scripture text this morning responsively. Again, you will read the bolded portion. This reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version. Let us share in reading Romans 12, 9 through 21 together. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. 
Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. us how to pray. Let us pray together. Gracious God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us day after day. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and will respond. Today we ask you to bless our earthly fathers for the many times they reflected the love, strength, generosity, wisdom, and mercy that you display in your relationship with us, your precious children. 
but we also recognize that not all fathers have lived up to these ideals. Give them grace to acknowledge and learn from their mistakes. Give us grace to extend to them the same forgiveness that you offer us all. Help us to resist the urge to stay stuck in past bitterness, instead moving forward with humility and peace of heart. We ask your blessing on those men who served as father figures in our lives. Help them to know that their influence has changed us for the better. Give new and future fathers the guidance they need to raise happy and holy children, grounded in a love for you and other people. And remind them that treating their wives with dignity, compassion, and respect is one of the greatest gifts that they can give their children. And we pray with gratitude for our fathers who have passed into the next life and have been welcomed into your loving embrace. We thank you again for their life lived among us and the precious memories that even now sustain us. We pray for the world around us, for the many who continue to suffer and call out for help. We pray for those enduring the violence of war in Ukraine and Afghanistan and so many other places, and for those fleeing for safety. Protect their bodies and minds, and let peace prevail on earth. We pray for those caught in natural disasters, wildfires in New Mexico, drought in the West, flooding in Yellowstone, help us to participate in the healing of your creation. And we also pray for our family and friends who are suffering, those struggling physically or emotionally, those awaiting diagnoses, recovering from surgeries and injuries, walking the sometimes long path to healing, we pray for those working to overcome addictions and mental illness, those facing challenges at home or at work, and those grieving the death of a loved one. God, you have called us to pray for our enemies, to bless rather than curse those who deliberately seek to harm us. And this is not an easy ask, and so we seek your help. As you bless them, also open our hearts so that we may see them as you see them and be able to respond to them with your love. We pray for this congregation, our sisters and brothers in Nuevo Renacer, the Hempfield Church of the Brethren, and your church around the world, that we would all be a living demonstration of your kingdom offering hospitality to all, ready to help in times of need, showing love to friends and enemies alike, seeking to live in peace with all. God, we praise you for your faithful love and for the mercy you have shown toward us. Open our eyes to recognize your presence in our lives. Give us grace to hear your call to costly discipleship and courage to follow without hesitation. It's in the name of the one who modeled costly and unconditional love that we pray. Amen. Our scripture text this morning offers practical guidance for showing love. Contribute to the needs of God's people. Welcome strangers into this church home. These calls of hospitality are answered when we give of our time, talent, and treasure. Let us practice love and offer our gifts to God this day. 
Will the ushers please come forward to receive our offerings? Let's pray. Creator God, in remembrance of your wonderful works and your overflowing abundance, we bring gifts that we receive from your hand. Generous one, in gratitude for your miraculous deeds, we bring these offerings of praise. Loving spirit, in joyous trust, we place these blessings in your keeping to bless a world in need of your love. Amen. So it is with great joy that we celebrate that 12 people, which is a lovely biblical number, don't you think, have responded to God's call to serve in the deacon ministry here in this place. And they will join our four current deacons, Jerry and Linda Bushong and Joel and Don Musser. We are grateful to you, church, that you prayerfully considered who God was pursuing, and we ask your continued prayer for them as they faithfully serve their call here in this place to you and to God. So at this time, I would like to invite our new and our current deacons to come forward, Joe Buell, Kathy Funderwhite, Cindy Heisey, Steve Hess, Bill and Phyllis Kepner, Shirley Smith, Daryl and Karen Strine, Dawn and Sarah Wagner, Joel and Dawn Musser, Walt Vanderheeden and Jerry and Linda Bushong cannot be with us this morning.
So how we're going to do this is um, I'm going to offer uh, some vows for you to take. Then I will invite you to come a little bit closer and turn around so <laughs> that the congregation um, can make their vows back to you. Um, and I also have some fantastic reading material. <laughs> These are the deacon's manuals. They are every possible thing you could think of. Um, so you will pick and choose from this how you serve, so don't panic. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit has directed the church to set apart deacons to look after identified needs and to labor for the spiritual unity and growth of the members of Christ's body. Those called to this office are people whose commitment and faithfulness have been proven in relationship to the local fellowship of believers. They have a spiritual mind and are open and responsive to the Holy Spirit and carefully exercise wisdom and sound judgment while being faithful and loyal to Christ and the church. The Mountville Church of the Brethren, having full confidence in the faithfulness, loyalty, wisdom, and spiritual integrity of you all, according to the practice of the Church of the Brethren, has called you to be deacons. Insomuch as the church has called you to be deacons, I now ask you to respond to the following questions. Do you declare anew your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I do. I do. Will you seek to cultivate more fervently your spiritual life by Bible reading, meditation, prayer, and Christian witnessing? If so, please say, with God's help, I will. With God's help, I will. Will you encourage and lead the congregation in deepening its spiritual life and its ministries of compassion? If so, please say, I will. I will. Will you seek to be a good example in faith and in conduct? If so, please say, I will. Do you then accept the call to the ministry of deacon in this body of Christ and promise to perform faithfully the duties thereof? If so, please say, I do. I do. Come on up and turn around. Church, I invite you to stand. Do you, the members of this body of Christ, in the spirit of joy and in renewed loyalty to our Lord, acknowledge and receive these new deacons? Do you promise to pray for them and support them in confidence, encouragement, cooperation, and prayers, that together we may increase in the knowledge and the love of God manifested to us in Christ Jesus. If so, please say, I do. Okay, I want to invite you, since we're not all gonna come up here and lay hands on one another, to just kind of reach out and we will pray together for our new deacons. Eternal God, you have come in Jesus Christ not to be served, but to serve. Now we set apart and consecrate these, your servants, to this ministry of deacon, that they may serve in your name. Grant them deep compassion for human needs. Fill them with tender care and steadfast love for those for whom Christ died. Inspire them with devotion to your church. Grant them growth in faith that they may lead others by precept and example. 
Grant to the church the grace to work with them for the increase of faith and caring within the fellowship. And holy God, sustain them in their labors and give them joy. Through Christ we all pray together. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are now set apart to this sacred ministry of deacon. Serve God and this con congregation faithfully, and may God bless you in your service. Don't run off. I want to give you your gifts. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Okay, you two get to practice the art of sharing. <laughs> Oh! 
after a two-week break, we are now returning to our exploration of the theme of annual conference, Embracing One Another as Christ Embraces Us. As you may recall, this year's moderator, David Sollenberger, selected that overarching theme as well as the daily themes and scriptures that we have been working with. And for this week, he chose the Romans passage that we read together to illustrate the theme, embracing one another in our diversity as a faith community. So I have to confess, I'm not sure I understand exactly what he hopes to do here. <laughs> so I am eager to hear Nathan Rittenhouse preach this passage at conference later in July. And as I said, we will provide the links for you if you would like to watch the worship services live online during that week. But in an effort to remain faithful to this theme, we talked a little bit in scripture chat about the diversity in this congregation. Now, perhaps at first blush, diversity isn't easy to see. However, if we look just a little deeper, we will discover diversity in our levels of education, for instance. Some of us live an urban lifestyle while others are more rural. There's diversity in our political thinking and even in our theology. We are not, when you stop and think about it, a fully homogenous group by any means. And so it must be something more than just simply having things in common that draws us together. And I would suggest that it is the desire to follow and serve Christ that unites us. But even in that seemingly obvious statement, there's room for diversity in how we do that, right? It leaves space for us to work around some core values to unite us. And this is part of the work that we'll be doing over the course of the next year under the guidance of longtime district executive minister, Randy Yoder. And as we start this process, these verses in Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome provide a good framework. And as one commentator wrote, would function brilliantly as a group covenant for any gathering of people of faith. So it seems important. Let's dig in. What are we being called to as disciples of Christ? To put the text that we read this morning into context, Paul spent the first 11 chapters in Romans assuring believers that God's grace is extended to both Jews and Gentiles. 11 chapters intended to unify them in the midst of this huge diversity, chapters that encourage them to embrace one another fully. And then he begins chapter 12 with the word, therefore. Therefore. Therefore, as equal recipients of God's grace, Paul lays out how we must live our lives as individuals and communities of faith. Of course, the struggles for unity within their new faith community were exacerbated by the environment in which they found themselves. Not only were they learning how to live differently as communities defined by the life and teaching of Jesus, but they were taking actions that were countercultural to the imperial Roman system of privilege and power. They were learning how to live into Christ's claim on the Sermon on the Mount that they and we are the light on the hill. It is hard to live counterculturally, isn't it? It's a lot of work. <laughs> And sometimes it's dangerous work. We want to fit in and we want to be accepted 
and we want to be comfortable, and sometimes those needs can be in conflict with Christ's claims on our lives. In this passage, Paul lists more than 20 attributes and actions that followers of Christ should adopt. And all of them fall under the umbrella of loving God and loving neighbor. And I could probably do an entire long sermon series on each attribute. But in the essence of time this morning, I want to focus on just a couple. And if I'm only going to do a couple, I may as well do the hard ones, right? Verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. And verses 20 and 21. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is what we're called to do. This is why church matters, friends. What the church has to offer is an invitation to be part of a new community that nurtures believers to live differently and to live out their calling both within the faith community and with the wider community. Theologian Rochelle Stackhouse wrote, to say that our core values include not only extending hospitality to strangers, but blessing and feeding and refusing to take vengeance on enemies will put a strain on some within our churches, let alone on relationships with those outside the faith community. She continues, this passage is not a greeting card slogan, but a call to costly discipleship. And it is based on Jesus' invitation in Matthew 16, 24, to take up our cross and follow. So let's talk first about hospitality. As someone who was recently welcomed here, I know that one of our core values is indeed hospitality, and I am not alone. As I've gotten to know you, uh, I have heard from many of you that what drew you here was the warm welcome that you've received. We are indeed a warm and welcoming congregation. And research shows that growing churches report that those who joined after a time of visiting did so because they found the community to be a spirit of love and hospitality, and it was attractive. And it was not just in the way that the members treated visitors, but it was in the way they treated one another as well. Churches should be practice fields for living the covenant of love that Paul describes both here in Romans and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But we must not confuse hospitality as friendliness or even charity. Hospitality is an act of justice. It's meeting the needs of our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and strangers, but it's not just that. Biblical hospitality and love includes involvement in a constant struggle for the dignity of all people, including the basics, a place to live, and access to food and health care. It commands a love for one another as if all people were your brothers and sisters. It means we do not allow the slavery, servitude, torture, or cruelty of another human being to become acceptable for any reason. And it commands that we honor every single person God has created. This is what it means 
to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Anybody uncomfortable with that phrase? I feel like we need to talk about what that means, hate what is evil. I mean, asking us to hate something seems a bit wrong, yeah? What is hate exactly? What is evil? Is it one of those things that we just know it when we see it? I want to start with evil. According to Merriam-Webster, that word can be either an adjective, as in evil intent, or it can be a noun. Evil as an adjective means morally reprehensible, and it requires judgment as to what that is. But evil as a noun is anything that brings sorrow, distress, and calamity. It includes things like bullying and hate speech, physical or emotional harm. It includes excluding and marginalizing the other. Basically, it is anything that demeans anyone made in God's image, which we know is everyone. And as followers of Christ, we are to hate that. So what does hate mean? Theologian Karen Baker Fletcher explains that to hate in the biblical sense is to be repulsed. The point is to be so strongly repulsed by evil that we turn to the good. And in turning to the good, vengeance is not the tool for resisting evil because vengeance comes from hatred and hate is not love. We form strong emotions, don't we, in the face of evil? Emotions that make us want to act out, sometimes harmfully. But Paul warns, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. To illustrate what that could look like, I want to offer a modern example. This incident happened in 2014 in Von Diesel, Germany. Von Diesel has been a long neo-Nazi mecca because one of Adolf Hitler's deputies, Rudolf Hess, no relation, was buried there. Neo-Nazi groups would show up regularly for demonstrations and marches, bringing fear and anxiety to the community, shouting slogans of hate speech, sometimes erupting into violence. And the community began to feel that they were living under siege, and it was scary, until sometime someone had an idea. It's a crazy idea. They sought out sponsors to donate money to nonprofit programs whose mission is to fight hate speech and racial violence for each step that the neo Nazi marchers took. It was billed as Germany's most involuntary walkathon. Organizers created signs to hold up along the route, signs that said, keep going, and one foot in front of the other. And they wrote on the streets themselves, thanking the marchers for raising so much money to fight hate. They even set up water tables along the route for the marchers, and they provided bananas to keep their energy up. Kind of a spin, right, on Paul's command to love your enemies if they're thirsty give them something to drink if they're hungry give them something to eat they went so far as to paint numbers on the roads so that the marchers would be forced to see how much money they had raised at each milestone a report on this event by britain's sophie foundation found that this means of engagement was so successful that other communities throughout germany began to adopt it do not repay anyone evil 
for evil. Do not be overcome by evil. In our work of hospitality, in our work for justice and love, Paul warns that we must not be overcome by evil. To be overcome by evil means we let spite infect and spread through us like a disease. We are overcome by evil when instead of expressing words of love, we shame and demean, or as fourth century monk and theologian Pelagius says, the enemy has overcome you when he makes you like himself. The essential victory over evil is the work of love. It's challenging work. It's countercultural. It's costly discipleship. It's the Jesus way. And I might add, it's not for the faint of heart. As John Pavlovitz writes, it is easy to be perpetually terrified. Everything is a threat. There is always a lack. The enemies are forever encroaching. The bad guys are always looming. And this ever-present fear ends up getting transformed into violence and bigotry and selfishness and hatred that even seeps into the church. He proclaims, we want a church that produces fruit that resembles Jesus, one that defaults to compassion, one whose love has no borders, whose generosity knows no walls, one whose burden is the poor and the hungry and the invisible. Oh, church, may it be so. Amen.
As we go forth, may God give you grace to count others better than yourselves and to love your enemies and to seek peace. God, send the spirit of truth to keep alive in us what Jesus taught and did. Jesus, who reigns on high, one God, now and forever, go in love and service to the world. Amen.